imagine that you're looking for a stable partner, right? So you might think, well, what do you want in a stable partner? And at least in principle, one of the things you don't want is too much mismatch between you and that person on the five fundamental dimensions. So for example, if you're really extroverted and you have a really introverted partner, you're going to engage in continual conflict about how much social activity the two of you should subject yourself to. And it's very, very difficult for people who broadly differ, widely differ on those dimensions to come to consensus because it's not just a matter of opinion, right? It's really a matter of different, if you're looking at extremes, of really different types of people. And the thing about introverts is they just don't enjoy large-scale social interaction that much. One-on-one, -on -one, they're often fine, but in a group, they don't like that, and they, it tires them out. Whereas a real extrovert, it's like you isolate them and, and they just wither on the vine because a huge part of what actually motivates them in a positive way is tangled up with social interaction. And so, if you're an agreeable person and you have a particularly disagreeable partner, you're also going to run into problems because the agreeable person will say, whatever you want, whenever, and the agreeable per a disagreeable person will say, well, I'd like to know what the hell you want for a change and be much more harsh and much more demanding in the situation. And the ag agreeable person is going to find the disagreeable person harsh and unpleasant. And the disagreeable person is going to find the agreeable person wishy-washy and unable to stand up for themselves. And again, that's, a, that's actually one of the primary sources of tension between men and women, because women tend to be higher in agreeableness than men. It's about half a standard deviation, which is quite, quite, a, quite, a, uh, quite a large difference by psychological standards. So th there's the problem with agreeableness. With conscientiousness, well, if you're conscientious, you're industrious and orderly. And orderly people seem to be sensitive to disgust, which is something we'll talk about in detail later. But our latest uh, idea is that, my, it's not my idea, it's actually the idea of my graduate student, Christine Brophy, um, is that industrious people find it um, unpleasant and unsettling to, to not be doing something. So it isn't so much that industriousness makes them happy or fills them with positive emotion. That would be more extroversion, right? Because extroversion is the positive emotion dimension. It's that industrious people can't stand sitting around doing nothing. And you know, this is speculation, but you know, human beings are obviously always engaged in the exchange of labor, especially the reciprocal exchange of labor. And you can imagine that um, in a, in a community where everyone knows everyone, the people who work hard are going to be pretty irritated on a fairly chronic basis with the people who are completely unproductive. And my suspicions are that plenty of people who were completely unproductive in the history of, of, our, of the evolution of our species were wiped out by people who were unhappy with their lack of productivity. And so I think, generally speaking, human beings have this sense of ethical obligation with regards to one another to share labor. And people who are conscientious really, really feel that. So they feel bad if they're not busily working on something that's productive all the time. And so the advantage to being with someone conscientious is, well, they're going to work like mad. But the disadvantage is they're, they're going to work like mad. So, you know, if you're looking for a partner that you want to relax with or have fun with or, or who isn't uptight, then a conscientious person is probably not a very good choice. On the other hand, if you're a conscientious person and you're living with someone who's really unconscientious, that's good because they might be able to help you relax, but you're not going to be happy with them because they don't work nearly as hard as you do. But even worse, on the orderly dimension, you know, some of you have had roommates and maybe you're more orderly than your roommate. What does it mean? It means you're annoyed by mess before they are. And you don't have to be annoyed by mess much before your less orderly roommate for you to be the one that's always running around picking things up. And so actually, one of the things that's emerged from the psychometric analysis is that women are slightly more orderly than men. And I suspect that has something to do with the, un, what would you call it, inequitable distribution of housework. Because even if you're, imagine that your proclivity is to be triggered by disorder 25 seconds before your partner's. Well, you're going to end up, it doesn't take much difference for you to be the one that's always concerned about the mess first. So anyways, and so if you're a really orderly person and you live with a disorderly person, well, good luck getting along with them. They're gonna regard you as like uptight and, and uh, uh, over-concerned with details and, and, uh, and, well, and unwilling to relax, that's for sure. And they're gonna regard you as 
well, just a bloody mess, and how can anyone possibly live with someone like you? So, another reason why it's useful to understand your personality is because I think it gives you a better crack at finding someone that you can actually live with over the long run. And we don't know what the optimal... I don't think you want to live with someone who's exactly like you because then both of you have the same strengths and weaknesses. And there's a bit of a problem there, right? Because maybe an agreeable person can use a bit of disagreeable person around them to balance each other out and vice versa, right? So we don't understand the optimal balance for, for, for long-term thriving in a relationship. But I think we do understand the fact that if you're too different in your traits, that, those, that where you're different is gonna constitute a chronic source of conflict. The next most important thing is trust, man. It's like, there, there's no marriage that's successful without trust. You guys, you've got to tell each other the truth. And one of the reasons that Jung believed that marriage as a, and an oath and a Carl Jung as a bond was necessary, it's really wise. It's like, you know, telling the truth to someone is no simple thing because there's a bunch of things about all of us that are terrible and weak and reprehensible and shameful and all of those things. And they kind of have to be brought out into the open and dealt with. And you're not going to tell the truth about yourself to someone who can run away screaming when you reveal who you are. And so the, the marriage bond is something like, okay, here's the deal. I'm going to handcuff myself to you and you're going to handcuff yourself to me. And then we're going to tell each other the truth and neither of us are going to get to run away. And so our, once we know the truth, then we're either going to live together in mutual torment or we're going to try to deal with that truth and straighten ourselves out and straighten ourselves out jointly. And that's going to make our, us more powerful and more resilient and more and deeper and wiser as we progress together through life. And, and I think that's absolutely brilliant because if you leave the back door open, man, you're going to use it, that's for sure. And the oath is there. And this was Jung's commentary on the spiritualization of of the human pair bond by Christian marriage, for example, which which emphasized uh, the the what would you call it the subordination of both members of the marital union to a higher order uh, personality that was embodied in the figure of the logos. So the idea is that in a, in, a, in the Christian marriage, for example, the man isn't the boss and the woman isn't the boss. The boss is the mutual personality composed by the seeking of truth in both of them and that's conceptualized as their, their joint subjugation to the Logos and that is absolutely dead on man it's like the ruler of your marital life should be your vow to tell each other the truth because like in hard times during your life when you've done something stupid and idiotic that might take you down and you don't have anybody that you can turn to, you know, if you have a partner that you can trust, you can go say, hey, you know, I made a big financial mistake, man, and it's really torturing me, and I feel like a complete idiot, and it's really dangerous, and the person there is going to help you figure out what to do about it, and they're going to know that when they make a stupid mistake, and they're bloody well going to, that they can come and talk to you, and that you guys are going to work your way through it, and that's a big deal, and so... Um, well, you look for someone that you're attracted to, that you love, and then you look for someone that you can bloody well trust. And then you tell them the truth. And, and that way maybe you can get through life and you can have someone to weave the rope of your being with and together to make, to make your joint rope stronger. And you can have some continuity in your narrative and you can have children and then you can have grandchildren. And like you can have a life, man, and there's nothing. You're so fortunate if you can manage that.